Welcome everyone and thanks for joining us for today's webinar, Integrating In Vitro Micro Tissues and In Vivo Endpoints in Drug Discovery and Development, presented by Dr. Matthew Wagner, an Associate Director of Mechanistic and Investigative Toxiology at Takeda Pharmaceuticals. I'm Dr. Susie Valdez and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that today's presentation is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want during the presentation. Just simply click on that ask a question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the box. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email and following the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on that ask a question box and let us know you're experiencing a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Just click on the continuing education credits tab located on the top right hand corner of your presentation window and follow the process to obtain those credit credits. Without further ado, let me introduce our presenter, Dr. Wagner. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much, Susie. And I'm excited to talk to you today about one of my favorite topics, uh, about the idea of integrating in vitro micro tissues and other in vitro assays into in vivo endpoints in both drug discovery and development. Uh, so first off, some disclaimers. Uh, Peyton Manning, I am not. So no part of this talk is a paid or unpaid endorsement for or criticism of anyone's technology or medicine. Uh, these are my personal opinions and not the opinions of Takeda Pharmaceuticals or any of our collaborators. Uh, the second disclaimer is that I do work for a pharmaceutical company. I've worked for them in the past. I work for one now. And I hope to remain gainfully employed at a pharmaceutical company until my son's pitching arm is strong enough to support me financially. That's my son Tristan right there. And since he still wears high heels on his hands, uh, it might be a while until his contract comes in. So with those disclaimers out of the way, uh, let's just look at a very brief outline. Uh, I'd like to talk just a little bit about the promise and potential of 3D micro tissues, because those are not always one and the same thing. Uh, a little bit of the challenges and opportunities of using uh, advanced cell culture systems such as micro tissues as hazard identification tools. And, uh, and lastly, I, I would like to look at the uh, emerging potential application of neural micro tissues in drug discovery screening. So uh, it's no surprise to anyone in the field that microtissue research, uh, which is called organoid chip technologies, tissue chip technologies, spheroids, organoids, I conflate all of those things into one big happy uh, term, microtissue here. Uh, this field is rapidly expanding. It's been expanding exponentially for about the last 15 to 20 years or so, uh, without showing any signs of stopping anytime soon. And in fact, in the last year, we've seen some really exciting advances come out. In fact, uh, out of uh, Murat Sarit and Linda Griffith's lab at MIT, they were able to show in 2019 that they could keep 10 microphysiological systems not only alive and functioning, but intertwined and interconnected uh, for over 28 days. And so the potential of these things is understandably thought to be phenomenal. But I think that when us scientists read those sorts of publications that I had in the last slide, there's some sort of, there's, at some point something's lost in the translation where that makes it into lay press. Because from our excitement for these micro tissues uh, in the academic setting, it somehow gets translated into this idea that it could be the end of all human testing and you know clinical trials on a dish and completely replacing all, uh, all animal testing. And I think that there are a few steps to go before we get there, although, I am, by my nature, incredibly excited every time I see a new in vitro microphysiological system. Uh, when I hear that it's going to end all animal testing, I do get just a little skeptical. So I'd like to give you a little bit of context about what, both why I'm excited and, and why I'm a little bit skeptical that these things might be the be all and end all and total animal replacement in the years ahead. So. There are many, many different practical applications of micro tissues in drug discovery and development. Uh, they can help us translate uh, preclinical toxicity that we see in a mouse, a rat, a dog, or a monkey, and, and then help to understand how that toxicity in an animal may actually translate to humans. Uh, 
and, and perhaps even more usefully, uh, we can use them for early hazard identification. These are sometimes called uh, predictive assays, but I think hazard ID is a more accurate term. Uh, it, it, we can use them to help understand which molecules at a really early stage may cause toxicity far down the line. Uh, they can be used as clinical biomarkers. They can be used themselves as regenerative medicine tools. And I think the idea that we can use them for total animal replacement is a very laudable goal, and it's an important goal, and it's one that we should keep striving for. But it's one that we have uh, a lot of progress to make before we get there. And so what I'd like to focus on today are what I consider to be uh, practical intermediate steps between uh, where we are now and, and what total animal replacement looks like in the future. So uh, this slide is taken from a, a relatively recent paper, Nature of Use Drug Discovery, uh, where they're looking at really what's causing drugs to fail uh, in development. And, and what you can see, I've really cherry-picked just uh, one of the figures here. And, and if you look at the red stars, you can see that 39% of all development compounds failed in GLP tox. Uh, here looking at a snapshot of four different pharmaceutical companies' pipelines over about a 10-year period and about 11% of those compounds failed in the clinic due to clinical safety. So all in, we had over 50% of late stage attrition was being driven by either toxicity or safety concerns, which is really why we get so excited about all these different uh, organoids and, uh, and, and tissue chips and integrated microphysiological systems like we have pictured there. But the, the scope of the challenge, I think, is a lot bigger than some people realize. So if you look at what's recommended by uh, the Society for Toxicologic Pathology, STP, they, rec they recommend over 40 different tissues be taken on a GLP tox study and examined by a board-certified pathologist in order to make sure, from two different species, in order to make sure that that drug is safe in us enough to progress into humans. So even if we did have you know, the best heart on a chip or brain on a chip available, you know, the likelihood that we will one day have 40 separate and interactive uh, chips for adrenal glands and aortas and bone and brain and cecum all tied together, I think that that's, it's, it's a ways from where we are today. And I think it's helpful to maybe focus on more intermediate uh, goals, like focusing on a, a single species tox package, or what I'll be focusing on today, just trying to uh, put our best molecules forward, integrate safety by design into our drug discovery pipeline, and, uh, and, and trying to make the best of the animal data that we have. So maybe we don't have 40 tissue chips and micro tissues that we can use to predict toxicity. But what if we just focus on those primary drivers for attrition? Uh, so this is from a 2014 uh, Nature Reviews drug discovery paper looking at the AstraZeneca pipeline. And these are all the various toxicities that caused attrition due to toxicity or safety, either in the preclinical space, the red bars, or the clinical space, in the brown bars. And, and what you can see here is that really you can capture just about 80% of all safety-related attrition if you focus just on eight organ systems. And so maybe an intermediate question could be, in an ideal world, would we want to have a predictive microtissue for each organ? Well, and, and I think that, that to answer that question, we have to recognize that toxicology has something of a unique challenge to it. So false positives affect us in toxicology very differently from the way they affect our friends in the pharmacology realm. So efficacious false positives. So if your in vitro assay tells you that your new drug is going to cure cancer, well, you will figure out that that, false posit that, that was a false positive when you move into your first or second or third in vivo model, and then you'll be able to swap out a better molecule uh, with something else that worked in vitro that will hopefully then work in vivo before you make it to the clinic. But toxicity false positives are very different. Very often, those red flags that get stapled to our molecules damage that molecule and cause it to be discarded. And so really what we want to focus on when we're looking at hazard identification and what are sometimes called predictive assays, we really want to focus on specificity, making sure that we don't have any of those type 1 errors, uh, false positives, uh, aberrantly calling a molecule potentially toxic. And let me show you why. So if we try to have a perfect microtissue system for just those 
eight different organ systems that drive 80% of the safety related attrition in AstraZeneca's portfolio we saw a few slides ago. And let's say that you had a pretty good assay that had say 70% specificity. Well, if you put every single molecule that your chemists had made, let's say you just had a, a fictional pool of 1000 molecules and you put them through eight different predictive micro tissues with 70% specificity, well, then you could expect 94% of your 1000 molecules to be discarded as false positives. And even if you have an incredibly specific in vitro assay, 90% specificity for uh, your eight different micro tissues and you ran them serially, well, then you could expect to throw away over half of your portfolio on false positives alone. You've discarded over half of your chemistry and not made a single person safer. So you can see why using these hazard identification assays for every single micro tissue might be problematic. So we do have to be just a little bit picky about the way that we uh, employ and, and deploy assays. So I think that the way that makes the most sense and, and is perhaps intuitive to everyone is that we want to try and focus on those primary drivers for safety related attrition. And, and amongst those primary drivers, perhaps none are more famous or more common than cardiovascular toxicity. And within cardiovascular toxicity, um, the cardiac post approval adverse event reports are dominated by proarrhythmia pro events over the last 20 years. And so uh, what we're looking at, and I'm sorry the videos didn't come through here, is, is the way that we can use uh, IPS-derived cardiomyocytes. Uh, and here, the paper that we're citing is just looking at uh, a 2D syncytium of cardiac microtissues. And what we're looking at is the, the idea that these 2D cardiomyocytes actually do a fantastic job of predicting proarrhythmia, uh, in this case, with procainamide. But it's not enough for us to have a, a couple positive controls. Sorry, that slide apparently isn't going to come through. It's not enough for us to just have a couple of positive controls. Uh, like I was saying before, we really have to be quite certain uh, of any of the data that we generate with a hazard identification assay. Um, because if we, uh, if we run every single molecule in our for portfolio through some sort of hazard ID assay, we need to be highly certain that this assay is highly specific and we won't be throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And so this is work that was done by Emily pfeiffer Koshik in my lab while she was at Vallis Sciences. And what she showed was that in the validation, in this case of over 90 compounds, all of which had clinical exposure and adverse event information, is that this 2D syncytium of IP-derived cardiomyocytes actually does a fantastic job of predicting that QT prolongation, which is directly related to proarrhythmia. And actually, it compares quite favorably with other assay systems that are currently uh, out there and being widely used, like non-rodent ex vivo assays, like the Langendorf assay. And so if we look at the sensitivity and specificity of these IPS-derived cardiomyocytes in this kinetic imaging cytometry assay, you can see that this assay and this validation set was 80% sensitive and over 98% specific which was vastly outperforming one review article that was looking at Langendorf and other ex vivo assays, where they reported it as having only 33% sensitivity and 80% specificity. So that 18% gap in specificity is massive because those are all compounds that would be thrown out with no safety or, or enriching benefit. And so uh, when you have an assay that has just 2% false positive rates, that means that when you're talking to your project team and your project chemists and you come back with a positive in your in vitro assay, you can say with high confidence, 98% of the time, this is something that would have caused, is likely to cause QT prolongation in the clinic. This is a high risk molecule. And so if we just play out the numbers on that for a minute, and, and I swear, I just use big round numbers, and these are all uh, ballpark guesstimates, so forgive me, I'm not a mathematician. So if we have 1,000 compounds, that 2015 paper we saw from Pfizer and AstraZeneca showed that, uh, okay, we could expect roughly 500 of those to be uh, lost due to safety-related uh, attrition. And so if we uh, look at the relative proportions, about 12.5% uh, 
uh, I'm sorry, about 25% uh, of safety-related attrition uh, can be attributed to cardiovascular toxicity. And if we look at this uh, iPS-derived cardiomyocyte assay as, be as being one that has 80% sensitivity and 98% specificity, well, then we could expect in a pool of 1,000 molecules to throw out 10 compounds as false positives from that pool of 500 safe molecules, and we would throw out 102 true positives and retain only 23 toxic molecules in our, uh, in our pool of 1,000 molecules. So what that gives us then is that gives us a pool of molecules that has been over five-fold enriched uh, for non-cardiovascular toxic molecules. So you're throwing out 10 true positives for every false positives. That is a really good benefit because you're, you're, uh, you're screening against a high-frequency toxicity with a high-specificity assay. But just because you have a high-specificity assay doesn't mean that you should be using trying to develop an assay with that high specificity for every single toxicity under the sun. What if we had a toxicity that was a lot less common, like phospholipidosis? And let's pretend that we have an assay that is every bit as good as the iPS-derived cardiomyocytes are at predicting proarrhythmia. Well, and we ran it on that same pool of 1,000 compounds, but with uh, a much less frequent toxicity, something that's present, uh, oh, in about only nine out of every 1,000 molecules that would come out of an, an average uh, uh, pharmaceutical company's portfolio. Well, we could expect to throw out the same 10 false positives that we threw out with our last assay, but uh, out of the uh, but we could accept, expect to throw out seven true positives and, and leave uh, two toxic molecules behind. So what that means is that in order to throw out seven true positives, we had to throw out 10 false positives. So there's no net enrichment for safer chemistry there. And, and this is the problem with trying to stack too many predictive assays on top of each other. And that's why we tend not to call these predictive assays. They're just hazard identification. And we use them to try to um, understand and prioritize molecules in the really early chemistry space and the lead generation, lead optimization space, uh, trying to choose chemical series and, and novel small molecules to move forward then into, uh, into mini talks or exploratory talk studies. Onto a little more complex 3D tissue system. Uh, this was some outstanding work that came out of AstraZeneca and Genentech's lab that was led by Will Proctor and Dominic Williams. And, and here, this is work that was done looking at uh, spherical human liver microtissues for the prediction of clinical drug-induced liver injury. Now, these human liver microtissues, they're self-assembled spheroids made of pooled primary hepatocytes from 10 different donors with non-parenchymal cells, including kupfer cells and liver sinusoidal endothelial cells, all wrapped up into that one happy little spheroid. Now, the benefits of this 3D culture system is that um, compared to 2D primary hepatocytes, these 3D tissues have greater drug me metabolic capabilities, cytochrome P450s, they're much longer lived, they have better albumin production, uh, more physiologically relevant bile acid handling, uh, including the transporter level, um, a more robust mitochondrial function, and they do have some semblance of an innate immune response because you do have kupfer cells in there. And here again, they have a, uh, a fantastic in vitro validation data set. And what I like about this data set in particular that I wanted to highlight here is that they're directly comparing the 3D assay from the exact same hepatocytes uh, plated in 3D, uh, which are the black dots there, and comparing it versus the 2D, which are in the white dots for each individual compound, which you see in columns. And we're looking at the cytotoxicity IC50 along the, the y-axis. So what you can see here is that these are, uh, I think, oh, 60-ish or so compounds, 69, I believe, uh, compounds that, uh, that are all known to have drug-induced liver injury in the clinic. And what you can see is that these 3D liver microtissues have a significant number of, uh, they are much more sensitive to drug-induced liver injury in vitro uh, when they're plated in 3D, the black dots, than they are in 2D versus the white dots. And, and this isn't trivial. I think this is something that is not often, it's not often enough demonstrated. These 3D assays come 
they come they bring along with them a much higher uh, opportunity and compound and uh, consumable cost and so we need to prove to ourselves and to our management that these 3d tissues are are worth the added time and cost burden what was nice about this data set is they also had a very robust number of true negatives. And so these are compounds that are in Dilly severity categories four to five. And what they showed here is that you had the exact same number of true po of false positives in, uh, in the 2D as well as the 3D assay. And they looked at, they did a very robust job uh, characterizing these 2D and 3D systems. And what they showed is that they had uh, identical specificity at, uh, at this optimal cutoff of 100 micromolar here. And the 3D microtissues had uh, almost double the sensitivity of their 2D counterparts. And so this helps us in a number of different ways. It helps to establish assay performance criteria. It helps us establish cutoffs based on risk tolerance for somebody's drug discovery portfolio. And it helps to provide appropriate context of use. You can figure out which mechanisms of toxicity this in vitro assay does a good job of picking up uh, versus a bad job of picking up. And, and we won't go too much into that today. But one of the things I really wanted to highlight here is that I think a lot of people focus on the very robust validation of these in vitro microtissues that are going on, but not often enough do I see it compared against the validation sets that have been performed for uh, our in vivo species. So um, our, our predictive in vivo models, the rat, the dog, the non-human primate, were looked at in a beautiful publication from Monticello et al. out of the IQ Consortium. And, uh, and they looked at a, a wide number of things in terms of the predictivity of our preclinical species for uh, clinical uh, endpoints. And, and they looked at 182 compounds that had completed their phase one trials and for which they had a complete GLP tox package. And then they looked at the concordance of, uh, of adverse events observed in the phase one trial versus what was observed in the rat, dog, and non-human primate. So I don't want to encourage us to make direct comparisons between the in vitro validation set on the left for the liver microtissues, looking at 110 compounds, and the in vivo set at the, on the right there, looking at 182 compounds. But I do think that we can look at these things side by side and begin to understand how these two in vitro and in vivo, they're not warring with each other, but they do help us do very different things. Um, you know, these in vitro assays are fantastic hazard ID tools. And so looking at the strong suits for, uh, for this in vitro system in this published data set, you can see that the positive predictive value in this 180, 110 compound set is pretty good. It's 88%. And so these in vitro liver microtissues show promise for early hazard identification with strong specificity and positive predictive value. And that same positive predictive value is something that might be kind of a weak spot for the rats or dogs, if you look at the Monticello paper on the right. Instead, where these in vivo systems are so important is if those in vitro systems are great at hazard identification, the in vivo systems are much better at risk assessment. So one thing that we don't often do with our in vitro assays is try to establish some sort of a um, an in vitro margin of safety where we say you need 30-fold margin before between your Cmax and an in vitro IC50. Uh, I think that if that if those data are out there to make a strong case for doing that with cell-based assays, um, then then I have not yet seen it developed, and I would love to. But at the moment, they seem to be useful hazard identification tools. We have a lot more experience with the preclinical species, though, from a risk assessment perspective. So we can actually use them to to both identify. The, the target tox organ tissues, as well as trying to measure the risk to humans based on exposure that was seen preclinically and the exposure that's predicted to be seen clinically. And one thing that I think these in vivo tools are fantastic at that our in vitro tools really don't get at is these in vivo studies have very strong negative predictive values. So um, looking, focusing here just on drug-induced liver injury in this 182 compound set, you can see that the negative, uh, I'm sorry, the specificity of the non-human primates, and especially when you combine the rodent and non-rodent species, you have outstanding 98% uh, specificity. So if it calls something a positive, it's going to be a positive. And in fact, if you have uh, either species that has 
uh, called the liver safe, well then that negative predictive value is pretty fantastic at 92% uh, in this data set. And so a lot of people try to think of in vitro and in vivo in a warring sense, and I don't see it like that at all. I think that we use them for very different things. And this is just one example of how these, these two tools are not meant to replace each other, but rather complement each other. Uh, another perfect example of that is you can see uh, from this uh, table on the right that the rodent and non-rodent species don't always agree. But those liver microtissues on the left, they're available in uh, rat, dog, non-human primate, and human versions. So we can use these liver microtissues to actually understand and pick apart mechanistically uh, what might be driving these species-specific liver toxicities. And so I'd like to talk to you about one more type of uh, safety-related attrition that's of intense interest for me of late, and, and that's really looking at uh, CNS toxicity. Now, CNS toxicity is a really tricky one. Uh, it's incredibly common, especially in the clinic. But if you look at this 2014 publication from AstraZeneca, you can see that uh, far and away, it, the preclinical toxicity, those things you're able to pick up in vitro and in preclinical species, um, you only lost seven due to CNS toxicity in the preclinical space. But if you look in the clinic, you had 34 molecules that were lost due to clinical CNS toxicity. So there's obviously a very large predictivity gap uh, that, that isn't unique to AstraZeneca. That's something that um, it, it, through, it exists throughout all of pharma. So why is our CNS attrition so high and is it, why is it so tough to predict with our existing in vitro and in vivo tools? Well, these CNS toxicities are primarily identified as clinical and histopathological observations made on animal models of CNS function during GLP tox studies during relatively narrow slices of tissue and time. And unlike cardiovascular rated, uh, related attrition, there are no mandated electrographical uh, telemetry studies to, uh, to give us a reading into um, uh, what might be happening at the EEG level uh, for all these CNS targeting drugs before they make it to the clinic. There are no readily monitored or validated biomarkers for toxicity like ALT or ASTR for liver or serum creatinine or blood urea nitrogen R for kidney. And there's very poor predictivity of neural structural and functional toxicity in preclinical species. So there was a, a fantastic publication by Andy Mead um, when he was still at Pfizer, uh, looking at 141 compounds and looked at the concordance between the neurofunctional assessments in the, uh, in the Irwin test, so it's called, and then the concordance of those observations in the phase one clinical trials, namely headache, nausea, dizziness, fatigue, somnolence, and pain. And they found that those were not predicted by the functional observation battery, uh, battery or the Irwin test. And so uh, that begs the question, why? Uh, why is this so hard to predict? Well, and I think that histopathologically, they've done a lot of work to look at, to, to examine this. So uh, credit to Mary Carcillo, head of global uh, pathology here at Takeda for giving me this slide and educating me on the topic. Um, but when it comes to pathology, there's actually a relatively narrow window within which you can catch this neurotoxicology. And so this is a publication by uh, Robert Switzer where he's looking at uh, just about 10 molecules and the actual uh, the peak cell death that's visible under H&E staining uh, days post-administration. And what you can see is after delivering something that we know to be CNS toxic, I believe here in rodents, uh, and what you can see is that uh, the visible toxicity really peaks in the two to five day time frame. And then after that, those dead or dying cells have been cleaned up and cleared out so that by the time you're reading out your GLP tox study at 14 or 28 days or, or three months or six months, uh, there's nothing more to see. And so there's a dearth of predictive preclinical models across the industry. And I really think that that's what's driving the high levels of CNS tox related attrition. And so it's that that was driving us to want to investigate more these neural micro tissues. Now, this is a neural micro tissue developed by uh, Stemonics out in San Diego. And these are cortical spheroids, and they're highly homogenous in size and, competition, uh, and composition. They're about 500 microns in diameter, and they're a balanced composition of both cortical neurons and astrocytes at a 50 50 ratio. Those neurons are a good mix of inhibitory, the GABAergic, and the excitatory, the glutamatergic, 
uh, neurons at an 80-20 ratio in favor of the glutamatergic. And best of all, they're platable in a 384 well uh, plate format, meaning that uh, pharmaceutical toxicologists like, my, like myself can run the dose response curves and the large scale validation sets that we need in order to understand and validate uh, these assays for hazard identification. So uh, one of the things that we really like about these cell types um, is that not only do they have some of the uh, not only do these neural microtissues have some of the cells that we care most about, but they have some of the function that we care most about. And this was something that was unique to these uh, microbrain tissues. And in fact, one of the other mini brains that we looked at uh, had hardly any in vitro calcium dynamic at all. But when we put a, uh, a calcium sensitive uh, dye and then looked uh, under a flipper, what you can see is that these neural microtissues uh, actually have a fantastically robust and repetitive uh, calcium bursting signal. And, and we measured six different uh, parameters within that calcium oscillation, looking at peak amplitude, peak spacing, peak width, peak count, among, along with rise time and decay time. And what Qin Wang and Colin Choi in my lab did is they looked at combinations of cell viability after one week, as well as compound induced effects on calcium oscillation up to six hours, uh, straddled around the, uh, the C-max of uh, over 80 different pharmaceuticals with known clinical adverse event and exposure profiles. And uh, sorry, this is a beautiful video that we'll have to show you some other time, but that's not gonna play here today. And so and what we found is that uh, these microbrains really give us a, a robust and reproducible measure of a number of different types of neurotoxicity. And so um, the videos behind these beautiful still images were taken by Colin Choi in my lab. And, and what he showed is that when you put on a seizureogenic molecule like uh, four aminopyridine, um, that you can double the number of bursts that you would see over a 45 second time period. So you've doubled the amount of neuronal activity uh, with a seizureogenic compound. So that's obviously something that's, uh, uh, that we would hope would be indicative of seizure-like activity in vivo. Uh, looking at other types of more uh, obscure neurotoxicity. So here we treated microbrains with compounds for 30 minutes. Um, at concentration straddle, straddling a clinical Cmax, and we measured the calcium signal um, in these uh, in these cortical microtissues in response to MPTP challenge. Now, MPTP is an interesting molecule because it itself is not toxic, but it is a lipophilic compound that's known to cross the blood-brain barrier. And once it's in the brain, MPTP is metabolized by the glia into MPP plus by monoamine oxidase B in the glial cells. MPP plus itself is toxic. And so what we're seeing in a relatively short time window is that this MPTP is being taken up by these neural uh, microtissues, metabolized by the glial cells, and then it's directly altering the, the number of peaks, which you can see reflected there in the peak count as we're going at higher and higher concentrations from the left to the right along the x-axis. And so this gives us some, some hope that these uh, neural microtissues may be metabolically competent and functionally responsive to neurodegeneration, at least in this case, due to MPTP. Uh, looking at other models of neurotoxicity, so here we're looking at canic acid, which is a very commonly used uh, uh, molecule for kindling, and it's very popular for in vivo models of, uh, of epilepsy. It's a direct agonist of the glutamic kinate receptors, and large doses uh, of concentrated solutions produce immediate neuronal death by excited, excitotoxicity. And so what you can see here within, I believe, a 30-minute time window is that uh, increasing concentrations of canic acid um, create a very rapid loss of not only peak amplitude, but also the peak count. And so, uh, again, reinforcing the idea that these microbrains are both metabolically competent and functionally responsive to uh, neurodegeneration by canic acid. But 
uh, like I was mentioning at the beginning, we really can't rely on these small sets to, to validate our in vitro assays. We really need to be able to establish context of use and appropriate cutoffs on very large validation data sets. And so we're, we're currently running a, a large validation data set ourselves, uh, looking at a number of different mechanisms of neurotoxicity. And, and we won't have time to go into it today, but suffice it to say that um, with a brief overview here of uh, the, the multitude of mechanisms of neurotoxicity, uh, as well as the high level message of our, our validation data set down here, is that we're very excited about this microbrain model and, and its potential moving forward as we and others uh, help to validate this model and really begin to understand its potential utility as a, a translational and a hazard identification tool. And with the last couple of minutes I have before uh, the, the talk is done, uh, first of all, I have to fulfill every toxicologist's obligation of having at least one quote from Paracelsus per presentation. So uh, there you go, poison is in everything and no thing is without poison. The dosage makes it either a poison or a remedy. Um, so that's my uh, contractually obligated um, uh, request fulfilled. But the reason why I wanted to focus on that today is because I think that the age of toxicology as a standalone discipline is is really beginning to fade away. I think that if we want to have greater impact, uh, both in discovery and development, then we really need to tr uh, team up with uh, QSP modelers and quantitative systems toxicology modelers so that we can take our mechanistic and our hazard identification tools and really begin to turn them into translational tools. So, and I'll give you one example of the ways that that can be done. So if we were looking at the effect of say, in this case, a kinase inhibitor on bone marrow, uh, increasing uh, concentrations in a, uh, in a rat exploratory tox study with an exploratory molecule caused um, maturation arrest in, in the erythroid lineage and, and some hypocellularity in the bone marrow. And, 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 they could, and the pathologist could tell by looking underneath the microscope that uh, these common progenitor cells, which uh, differentiate over a period of days into rubroblasts and prorubrocytes, and then rubrocytes and metarubrocytes, and then reticulocytes, and eventually into mature erythrocytes, um, they could tell that this process was halting, but they couldn't tell exactly where. And, and this is really where the modelers and the in vitro systems come into play, is that, so these findings were in rats, um, but uh, we couldn't tell exactly which stage this maturation arrest was occurring in, and we couldn't tell exactly what would happen in a human, because of course a rat is not a human. We understand this on both an intrinsic level as well as a quantitative level, and it's important to begin to stitch those things together. So starting with what we can do quantitatively with that sort of a, a maturation and differentiation protocol, uh, well, this was, uh uh, this is work that was really championed by Jay Metatol and Harish Shankar on at AstraZeneca. And, and what they were showing us was uh, using a variant of the Freiburg model. You can actually look at the way that free compound concentrations uh, have a direct effect on erythroid progenitors and then erythroblasts and reticulocytes and mature red blood cells and, uh, and hemoglobin in the circulation. And what's important to note here is look at these numbers uh, in the transitions from progenitors to erythroblasts. You can see that rats have a 48-hour transition time where humans have 83 hours. And for mature red blood cells, the, uh, the half-life for mature red blood cells is around 100, uh, 1,400 hours, whereas for a human, it's closer to 2,800 hours. So if we try to understand and, and quantify this toxicity using rat bone marrow as our model for human toxicity, uh, we're really putting ourselves at a disadvantage, both in terms of the biology, because we don't understand if the potency against rat differentiation is the same as it is for human, uh, as well as for the, the quantitative aspects of differentiation. And so uh, what many of us in the field have, have started doing is beginning to stitch together this semi-mechanistic modeling with this Freiburg type modeling that's more traditionally used for neutropenia modeling, but here the example is around anemia, and integrating the in vitro microphysiological systems where we can run in parallel, say, a model of human bone marrow loss and a model of rat bone marrow loss. And we can then determine if the human is more or less sensitive than the rat, and then overlay that on these understood quantitative differences in the differentiation timing and profiles for these preclinical species. 
And with that, we can begin to give estimates of clinical safety and begin to make recommendations to our clinical teams that say, like, listen, we, we believe that we may or may not have this risk based on what we've seen in vitro or in vivo. And if we do have this risk, we might recommend using uh, this sort of a dose and holiday schedule or this sort of a co-medication. And, or that we could expect these sorts of patients with high or low hematocrit levels to, to respond adversely. And those are exactly the sorts of graphs that I think that we need to be generating more and more moving forward. We need to go from being a, uh, a semi-quantitative field into a, a more quantitative field, at least on the in vitro side. And, and this is just a, a, a mock-up of what some of these sorts of analyses can look like, where you have um, where you can make predictions for the, uh, the hemoglobin loss for patients that either have a strong hematocrit or a weak but not quite anemic hematocrit going into your phase one trial, and how you might expect that uh, uh, compound administration to affect a wide range of patients over time and begin to call when you could expect those patients to stabilize, when you could expect them uh, to undergo grade one, grade two, or grade three anemia, all those sorts of things. So uh, that's that's really it for me. I wanted to thank everyone, uh, for both Harish and, uh, and Jay, for all the work that they did on the semi-quantitative modeling work, uh, as well as to Chin Wang and Colin Choi and Emily Koshak and Piyush Bajaj for all the work they've done in our lab here, and Jenny Cohen, Yvonne Dragon, and Bill Penny here at Decada. And I wanted to say, come join us. We're hiring immunologists and experienced drug discovery biologists at Takeda right now. So please check that out at takedajobs.com. And thanks a lot for your time and attention. Have a great day. And thank you, Dr. Wagner, for that informative presentation. I'd also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to remind everyone that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through May 2019. As a final reminder, Dr. Ragnar will follow up with any questions you've submitted via email. That's all for now, and thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.